Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome each and every one of you to today's lecture. We are here to continue our journey to a venerable scholarship in the field of human biology and its related fields. Earlier on, we established the fact that human biology is a branch of biology which focuses on the human being as a living organism. Furthermore, we established the fact that the field of human biology has various subfields and that one of those subfields is human anatomy and physiology. Did you know the word anatomy and morphology can be used interchangeably? Of course, in the olden days, the word morphology was applied basically to the external form of organisms. Today, what we used to refer to as morphology in the past could be referred to as external morphology. And if there is external morphology, then we can also afford to talk about internal morphology. Ladies and gentlemen, let us take note of the fact that each living organism, including the human being, has a form. And thus, we talk about morphology of organisms. You also know that each organism is made up of a cell or cells, and that each cell has its own form or morphology. Furthermore, the structures which constitute the cell the structures, the various structures which constitute the, the cell, for example, the cell of an eukaryotic organism also have forms. Think of the organelles which you explored during the cell biology lectures earlier on. You realize that each organelle has its own form or morphology. Did you know the term or the word organelles literally mean little organs. All organelles, be they mitochondria, ribosome, Golgi apparatus or Golgi bodies, endoplasmic reticulum, nucleus or nuclei have their own morphology. And I know you can afford to be to describe, I know you can afford to describe each and every one of them as you explored them not long ago. On the other hand, the word physiology has a different meaning and is not used interchangeably with the word anatomy or morphology. At this juncture, one may ask, what is human anatomy and physiology as a branch of human biology? or biology in general or simply put what is anatomy and physiology anatomy and physiology as a sub of a sub discipline okay anatomy and physiology as a sub discipline of human biology refer to the study of the body structures and function when you take anatomy and physiology together as a sub discipline of human biology you are talking about the study of the body structures and functions. For example, we can explore the anatomy and physiology of different organ systems. And by that, we will explore those various organ systems and how they work to maintain homeostasis. I hope you remember the meaning of the word homeostasis. Great. Gratitude. You are truly doing well. The word homeostasis refers to the process involved in the maintenance of normal internal conditions in a cell or an organism by means of self-regulating mechanism. Homeostasis refers to the maintenance of normal internal conditions in a cell or an organism by means of self-regulating mechanisms. Earlier on, we established the fact that homeostasis 
is a characteristic feature of all living organisms. I hope you remember the rest of the life processes and how biological scientists use them to diagnose or differentiate between living things and non-living things. Great. I give you a thumb up. Another important question we need to ask as part of our exploration of the field of anatomy and physiology is what is the difference between anatomy and physiology? What is the difference between anatomy and physiology? The difference between anatomy and physiology is that anatomy is the study of the structures of the body. Anatomy is the study of the structures of the body, whereas physiology is the study of the functions of the body. Physiology is the study of the functions of the body. For example, a study, for example, a study of the heart, a study of the heart, okay, or let's see. A study of the anatomy of the heart of a human being shows that it has four chambers and various muscles. When you study the anatomy of the heart of a human being, you realize that it has four chambers and various muscles. On the other hand, the physiology of the heart describes the way that the chambers and the muscles contribute to the heart's role of pumping blood throughout the body of the human. A study of the anatomy of the heart of a human being shows that it has four chambers and various muscles. On the other hand, the physiology of the heart describes the way that the four chambers of the heart and the various muscles contribute to the heart rule of pumping blood throughout the body of the human. Another question is, why should you or anyone choose to study anatomy and physiology? By that, I mean what is the purpose of studying anatomy and physiology. Ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of studying anatomy and physiology of the human is to understand the way the human body works and to help maintain health and prevent diseases. Yes, we explore, we study the anatomy and physiology of the human being in order for us to understand the way the human body works and to prevent or to help prevent uh, diseases and for that matter to maintain health. This field of human biology, anatomy and physiology, okay, which is also a branch of biology in general, is commonly studied by scientists, be the biologists, biochemists, medical doctors, pharmacists, nurses, other healthcare professionals, including the public health professionals who are more interested in preventive medicine and mostly serve in the area of human nutrition and dietetics, health promotion management, and disease control programs management. Another important question is, what are the subjects in the field of anatomy and physiology in general, or human anatomy in particular. Ladies and gentlemen, there are various subjects which are covered in the field of anatomy and physiology, and we will surely cover them. Some of these subjects are organization of the body of living things, organization of the body of living things. Using you as an example, through 
the study of anatomy of the human being, we can afford to say that you have various cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems in your body. The organ systems in your body, for example, include the nervous, cardiovascular, digestive, lymphatic, muscular, and reproductive systems, among others. Yes, there are several organ systems in your body. Remember, earlier on, even before you came to the university, you explored what we called biological organization, and you indicated that uh, living organisms are composed of cells, and that cells give rise to tissues, tissues give rise to organs, organs give rise to organ systems, and then organ systems constitute uh, an organism. Uh, anyway, biological scientists, including human biologists or those who specialize in anatomy and physiology, study along this uh, uh, various uh, levels of organization and so one of the key areas is organization of the body of living organisms another important area is what we call homeostasis which we just define and then we also study communication in the body note note that living organisms are living systems and individual living things living organisms are living systems and individual living things do you remember the cell theory great all living organisms including humans and those living organisms which are known to be pathogens of human diseases are composed of cells in other words all living organisms are composed of cells. You recall the fact that the cell is the basic unit of life. The fact that the cell is the basic unit of life can be expanded to read the cell is the basic structural and functional unit of life. The cell is the basic structural and functional unit of life. Furthermore, the cell theory indicates that all cells come from pre-existing cells. All cells come from pre-existing cells. Furthermore, the cell is considered to be a model of the whole living organism, which is epitomized in a very small unit. The cell is considered to be a model of the whole living organism which is optimized in a very small unit. Did you know, did you, the human body is composed of 30 trillion of cells. The human body is made up of 30 trillion of cells. Some authorities group these cells into approximately 215 types. There are authorities who group these cells into about 215 types. Did you know the cell can be put into certain categories, namely antigen presenting cells, contracting cells, endothelia cells, ion transporting cells, killing cells, nerve cells, phagocytic cells, secretory, uh, secretory cells endocrine, secretory cells exocrine, secretory cells matrix, sensory cells, stem cells, and supporting cells. Yes, the cells in your bodies may be supporting cells, stem cells, sensory cells, secretory cells matrix, secretory cells exocrine, secretory cells endocrine, phagocytic cells, nerve cells, killing cells, ion transporting cells, endothelia cells, contracting cells, and antigen-presenting cells. These cells or these cell categories possess different organelles which make them unique. Each of these cell categories has different organelles which make them unique. 
You also recall the fact that some organisms are unicellular organisms and others are multicellular organisms. Some of the multicellular organisms, they are able to assemble their cells to create permanent tissues. Did you know there are four main types of tissues in the body of human beings? Yes, you have four main types of tissue in your body. What are they? They are nervous, epithelia, muscular, and connective tissues. The tissues that I have in my body, the main ones are nervous tissue, epithelial tissue, muscular tissue, and connective tissues. Nervous, muscular, epithelial, and connective tissues are the main tissues that you have in your body. I have in my body. Human beings we have in our bodies. Did you know there are 10 large organs in the human body, namely the skin, which is considered to be the largest organ. We also have liver, brain, lungs, heart, kidneys, spleen, pancreas, thyroid, and joints. Yes, the 10 large organs in the human body are the skin, liver, brain, lungs, heart, kidney, spleen, pancreas, thyroid, and joints. Apart from these um, organs, there are many others in the human body. Please do well to do some research work and document as many organs as found in the human body. I am sure if you do a complete job, you may come across about 78 organs in the body of the human being. Today, I want you to take note of the fact that there are several subtopics which are covered within the field of human anatomy and physiology, as we have indicated earlier. Those topics can be put in an um, in in um, those topics can be put uh, in this way. Uh, we can talk about gross anatomy. We can talk about regional anatomy. We can talk about systemic anatomy and microscopic anatomy. Yes, there are several topics which are covered within the field of human anatomy. And if we choose, or we can choose to put them uh, into four categories, or usually they are put in four categories, gross anatomy, regional anatomy, systemic anatomy, and microscopic anatomy. The gross anatomy refers to the study of macroscopic structures in the body. Yes, we have structures in the body that we refer to as macroscopic, and there are others that we refer to as microscopic. The gross anatomy is about the study of macroscopic structures in the body. It can be further divided into additional sections, including surface anatomy and internal anatomy. The surface anatomy explores the features of the body without dissection. In other ways, when we look at the anatomy of the human, uh, there's aspect or the, the yeah, there is an aspect which we can explore, we can study without dissecting the human body, without cutting the human body and look, going into uh, the structures before we can study. They are external and we don't really have to do dissection before we can explore those structures. We also have what we call the regional anatomy, as I just indicated. What it is, what is it about? The regional anatomy, what is it about? The regional anatomy studies different regions or areas of the body, such as the head, 
the chest or the abdomen. The regional anatomy explores different regions or areas of the body such as the head, the abdomen and the chest. It can be important for understanding specific structures in one area of the body. It usually employs X-ray radiography, other imaging tools and techniques to help visualize certain areas of the body. As we explore regional anatomy, we usually, we often use X-ray radiography, other imaging tools and techniques to help us visualize certain areas of the body. The other subfields of uh, uh, human anatomy are the systemic and the microscopic. First, let's consider the subfield systemic anatomy. What is it about? The subfield systemic anatomy studies the gross anatomy of organ systems. The subfield systemic anatomy explores the gross anatomy of organ systems. And I have already mentioned some of the organ systems. You remember I talked about the respiratory, the lymphatic, or let's see the cardiovascular system the cardiovascular system these are examples of the system that we have in our bodies and the sub first systemic anatomy explores the gross anatomy of uh, organs such as these you know systemic anatomy is important for the scientists it is also important for, let's say, applied scientists like the physicians or clinicians. You know, the laboratory technologists, for example, also value systemic anatomy. Nurses and other health experts also value systemic anatomy. Why? This is because of the fact that diseases rarely affect only one region of the body. More often, Diseases affect multiple organs in an organ system. So, it is important for biomedical professionals to understand how organs work together to maintain homeostasis. In other ways, we study systemic anatomy particularly in our quest to secure an understanding of diseases. We study systemic anatomy particularly in our quest to securing an understanding of diseases. And as indicated, this is important because most diseases negatively affect multiple organs and organ systems. Through this aspect, we gain understanding of how separate organs do contribute to the overall structure and function of an organ system and organism and how disease may alter the normal conditions of these systems. In other words, through the subfold systemic anatomy, we gain an understanding of how separate organs in the body do contribute to the overall structure and function of an organ system or organism and how diseases may change or alter or modify the normal conditions of these systems. Lastly, we would like to explore the suffered microscopic anatomy. What is it about? What is the use? How does it work? Ladies and gentlemen, microscopic anatomy uses a microscope to magnify a body cell and tissues. Microscopic anatomy employs a microscope to magnify a body cells and tissues. This subfold of anatomy explores tissue section you know either at the cellular level or at the tissue level 
So the subfield of microscopic anatomy which explores tissue sections is called histology. And the kind which studies cells is called cytology. So we have histology which explores um, tissue, tissue sections and we have cytology which studies cells of the organism. Both histology and cytology are important tools for biological and medical scientists who study or research into the anatomy and physiology of organisms, including human beings. Yes, the field of histology and cytology are considered to be tools. And what are they for? And who, to whom are they important? They are important tools for biological and medical scientists who study or research into the anatomy and physiology of organisms, including the human being. These two tools can give us considerable insight into how diseases change the function of an organ at a base level and can provide guidance for possible treatments. I repeat, both cytology and histology as tools can give us considerable insight into how diseases change the function of an organ at a base level and can provide guidance for possible treatments. So, how do you think you as a nurse or physician or let's say medical or physician assistant in the making can understand and differentiate between symptoms and biomedical conditions. You, as an individual, how can you afford to be able to understand and differentiate between symptoms and biomedical conditions? The answer is simple. As part of your training, as part of your preparation, you are expected and required to take courses in basic sciences like you are doing right now. And then again, you are expected and required to be involved in diagnostic applications. And then again, you are expected and required to uh, involve in activities which will enable you to secure adequate, sufficient, or enough hands-on training in the field. And when all these are said and done, you will be able to understand and differentiate between symptoms and biomedical conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, based on what I have indicated so far, you do acknowledge the fact that the burden blocks of such studies are human anatomy and physiology. And human anatomy and physiology are branches of human biology which look at the structure and function of the human being. Take note of the fact that in the field of medicine, human anatomy and physiology delve into disease states in the human body, in addition to the therapeutic strategies which are used to, say, intervene or target and treat various human diseases. Yes, in the area of medicine, in the area of medical practice, human anatomy and physiology explore into details disease states in the human body, in addition to therapeutic strategies which are used to intervene, target, and treat diverse human diseases. We have talked about organ systems uh, in brief. How many organ systems do we have in the body and what are they for? How many organ systems do we have in the human body and what are they for? Again, what are the organs which constitute each of the organ systems that we have in our bodies as human being. Indeed, 
in the complex network of your body as a human being, there are 11 organ systems in your body. There are 11 organ systems in your body and they contain specific organs which share a common function. These 11 organ systems carry out key functions to maintain your physiological well-being. The organ systems, the organ systems, they carry out key functions to maintain your physiological well-being. Each of your organ systems possess a unique role. Each of your organ systems has a unique role. Your cardiovascular system, for example, oxygenates and circulates your blood throughout your body. Your respiratory system allows you to breathe life-sustaining oxygen. You have a digestive system which breaks down food and extracts vital nutrients, whereas your nervous system sends signals to every part, every corner of your body and thereby facilitating communication and coordination. Note that when an organ system gets affected by a disease condition, by a pathogen or a disorder, seeking timely and adequate, appropriate or right biomedical intervention becomes crucial to restoring normal function and preventing further complications. Yes, as soon as you detect some changes in your body, all right, it is important that you do not wait further, you do not delay in seeking treatment because seeking timely and appropriate uh, biomedical intervention when your organ systems get affected become crucial to restoring normal function and preventing further complications. You need to seek, you need to be able to seek treatment because it is important, it's crucial to restoring normal function and preventing further complications. You do not want your condition to worsen before you seek uh, treatment. In our a part of the world in Africa, we have people who delay, you know, who wait, and sometimes they will try and solve their problems, probably using another alternative. And when it does not work, then they will visit a health facility. But today, your take home is that when your organ system gets affected, seeking timely and appropriate or proper medical attention becomes crucial to restoring normal function of your organ systems and preventing further complications. So we've indicated that there are 11 organ systems which are found in your body as a living organism. Um, we've talked briefly about some of them. Uh, let's go a bit uh, deeper than we have done. Starting with the cardiovascular system. You hear of cardio, you hear of vascular. The, the, the cardio, you hear of vascular. The cardio has to do with the heart and the vascular has to do with the vessels. In other ways, uh, this cardiovascular system consists of the heart, blood vessels, and blood. The cardiovascular system, your cardiovascular system, comprises of your heart, your blood vessels, and your blood. What is your cardiovascular system for? Your cardiovascular system transports oxygen, nutrients, hormones, and waste products throughout your body. It helps regulate your body temperature, pH, and electrolyte balance and assists in immune system function. Yes, your cardiovascular system helps regulate your body temperature, P 
pH and electrolyte balance and assist in human system function. Talking about the pH, for example, earlier on in the chemistry of life or during the chemistry of life, we indicated that the human blood you know, has a normal pH of about 7.4. Um, due to the lifestyle, maybe what you eat, what you do not eat, and things like that, your choices in terms of diet, okay, or lifestyle, it is possible that your pH can become very low, you know, highly acidic. Okay, the pH of your blood can become very acidic. It's also possible that the pH of your blood could become highly or too alkaline or basic. When your blood pH become, becomes too low or highly acidic, you could or you will suffer a biomedical condition called acidosis. When your blood pH becomes very alkaline, let's say uh, uh, you get to a pH of about 7.8, for example, you could suffer a biomedical condition called alkalosis, which is preferable, the acidosis or acidosis. Alkalosis. Which one uh, is good? Acidosis or alkalosis? The reality is that each of these are life-threatening medical conditions. In other words, you should be able to avoid acidosis. You should be able to avoid alkalosis, as we indicated earlier. And thankfully, your cardiovascular system helps you to regulate your body pH. We just realized that your cardiovascular system also assists in immune system function. Yes, it is true we have the lymphatic system, but your cardiovascular system actually assists in immune system function. Another important uh, or organ system that we would like to explore is the endocrine system. The endocrine system. The endocrine system comprises of glands such as the pituitary gland, thyroid gland, adrenal gland, and reproductive gland. You know, you have endocrine system and your endocrine system is made up of or is is composed of glands and those glands include the pituitary gland, thyroid, adrenal and reproductive glands. What is the function of your endocrine system or the endocrine system? The endocrine system produces hormones which regulate bodily functions including growth, metabolism, reproduction and development. Your endocrine system, the endocrine, the endocrine system regulates bodily functions such as growth, metabolism, reproduction, and development. We also have integumentary system in our body. Your integumentary system. What, uh, what is it composed of and what is the function of that system. The integumentary system comprises of the skin, hair, nails, and glands. The integumentary system is made up of the skin, hair, nails, and glands. What is the purpose? What is the function? It serves as a protective barrier against external threats. It regulates body temperature and houses sensory receptors for pain, pressure and touch. Your integumentary system which consists of the skin, hair, nails and glands serves as a protective barrier against external threats, regulates body temperature and accommodates or contains sensory receptors for pain touch and pressure. 
I indicated earlier that you also have lymphatic system or we have lymphatic system in our body. What is the lymphatic system for? The lymphatic system is a network of lymph nodes, lymph vessels and organs. And those organs include the thymus and the spleen. You have lymphatic system and that system is a network of lymph nodes lymph vessels and organs such as the spleen and thymus what is the purpose or what is the function of your lymphatic system your lymphatic system aids in immunity by filtering and retaining interstitial fluid to the bloodstream and transporting fatty acids from the digestive system yes your lymphatic system helps in immunity by filtering and retaining interstitial fluid to the bloodstream and transporting fatty acids from the digestive system uh, so far you realize that um, the lymphatic system helps okay in immunity and uh, the cardiovascular system also helps in immunity what about the muscular system? Yes, you have muscular system. What is it for? And what um, is the component of your muscular system? Ladies and gentlemen, your muscular system is responsible for body movement. Yes, it is responsible for uh, body movement. Natural fact, muscles maintain posture, generate heat, and facilitate voluntary and involuntary movements. Muscles maintain posture, generate heat, and facilitate voluntary and involuntary movements. So your muscular system, what uh, is it composed of? Your muscular system includes smooth, skeletal, and cardiac muscles. So in one sentence, what will you say about your muscular system? You should be able to say that the muscular system your muscular system is responsible for movement and um, uh, helps uh, in maintaining posture generating heat and facilitating voluntary and involuntary movement and that it includes smooth skeletal and cardiac muscles another system that we should explore is nervous system nervous system ladies and gentlemen what is the nervous system uh, what is the rule what is the component of the nervous system the nervous system is a complex network which includes the brain spinal cord and sensory organs or nerves the nervous system is a complex network which includes the brain, spinal cord, and sensory organs or nerves. What is the function of the nervous system? The nervous system coordinates and controls bodily functions, relays messages through electrical impulses, and plays a vital role in sensory perception, motor control, and cognition. Yes, the nervous system, which is a complex network, including uh, the brain, spinal cord, and sensory organs or nerves, coordinates and controls bodily functions, relays messages through electrical impulses, and plays a vital role in sensory perception, con motor control, and cognition what does this mean this means that your nervous system controls how you interact with and respond to your environment by controlling the function of the organs in your other body systems your nervous system controls how you interact with and respond to your environment by controlling the function of the organs in your body and uh, uh, or, or uh, the function of the organs in your other body systems 
uh, let me take it again your nervous system controls how you interact with and respond to your environment by controlling the function of the organs in your other body systems and that is the sixth organ system that we have talked about what is the seventh one that we would like to talk about we would like to talk about the skeletal system sometimes in some books you will find musculoskeletal system you know but we've already talked about the muscular system and so we want to talk about the skeletal system uh, the skeletal system consists of bones cartilage ligaments and tendons your skeletal system consists of bones cartilage ligaments and tendons what is it for your skeletal system provides support protects internal organs allows movement and serves as a storehouse for minerals such as phosphorus and calcium yes you have skeleton in your body and your skeletal system provides support protects internal organs allows movement and serves as a storehouse for minerals such as phosphorus and calcium you also have what we call digestive system you know so the eighth system that we want to talk about is the digestive system what is the digestive system ladies and gentlemen the digestive system has the mouth teeth tongue salivary glands oesophagus or esophagus stomach intestines liver gallbladder pancreas rectum and anus among some other structures when you think of your digestive system okay when you think of your digestive system uh, remember you as part of its constituents you find the mouth teeth tongue salivary glands esophagus or esophagus stomach intestines liver gallbladder pancreas rectum and anus what is your digestive system for the digestive system is involved in the breakdown and absorption of nutrients as well as the excretion of waste your digestive system is involved in the breakdown and absorption of nutrients as well as the excretion of with but apart from these systems we've indicated that you have 11 so it means that we should explore the rest and another important system another equally important system is what we call the respiratory system the respiratory system what is the respiratory system for and what is the constituent of the respiratory system your respiratory system comprises of the nose or the nasal cavity mouth trachea pharynx larynx sinuses lungs which has alveoli bronchi or bronchus you know bronchi is plural bronchus is singular we can talk about the bronchioles and diaphragm what are some of the structures or the organs that you talk about uh, as far as your respiratory system is concerned we have the nose or the nasal cavity mouth trachea pharynx larynx sinuses lungs or let's say alveoli you know, uh, bronchi um, the singular is bronchus bronchioles and diaphragm what are they for what are they for as the name implies they help with respiration they help with respiration um when we look at the respiratory system we can talk about the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system the nasal cavity and pharynx constitute the upper respiratory system 
whereas the remainder of the organs form the lower respiratory system. The nasal cavity and pharynx constitute the upper respiratory system, whereas the remainder of the organs form the lower respiratory system. The tenth system that we like to look at, ladies and gentlemen, um, is urinary system. Urinary system. The urinary system is made up of the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. You know we have ureter and urethra. The uh, uh, ureter is spelled U R E T E R S, whereas urethra is spelled U R E T H R A. Your urinary system is made up of the kidneys, the ureters, bladder, and urethra. What is it for? Your urinary system filters blood, removes waste products, regulates fluid balance, and assists in maintaining proper electrolyte levels and blood pressure. Your urinary system helps you to filter blood, removes waste products, regulates fluid balance, and assists in maintaining proper electrolyte levels and blood pressure. This takes us to the 11th and the last organ in the system, or a last organ system in the human body, uh, and that is reproductive system the reproductive system. Ladies and gentlemen, before we draw the curtain, let us understand that the reproductive system differs between males and females. The reproductive system differs between males and females. What is it for? The reproductive system enables the production of gametes necessary for reproduction. And what is the constituent? The reproductive system structures, okay, uh, include the ovaries, the uterus, fallopian tubes, vagina, and cervix. Uh, in the case of the females, and these structures constitute the internal parts of the female reproductive system. Yes, the internal parts of the female reproductive system consists of the ovaries, uterus, fallopian tubes, vagina and cervix ladies and gentlemen the word vulva is the collective name for all the external genitals of a female the word vulva v-u-l-v-e is the collective name for all the external genitals of a female some people do mistakenly use the word vulva the, the, the word vagina, okay, some people mistakenly use the word vagina to describe all female reproductive parts. The fact is rather that the vagina is its own structure located inside the body of the female and therefore it is part of the internal parts of the female reproductive system. The the, the main part of the vulva or external genitalia are what we call labia majora, labia minora, clitoris, vagina opening, hymen, and opening to your urethra. If you are a female or if you are a male, then you simply uh, appreciate opening to the urethra. I repeat, the main part of the vulva or external genitalia, external genitals of a female or genitalia are labia majora, labia minora, clitoris, vagina opening, hymen, and opening to the urethra. Most of the male reproductive system is on the outside of the abdominal cavity or pelvis. Yes, at this stage we are talking about the male reproductive system and most of the male reproductive system is on the outside of the abdominal cavity or the pelvis. The external parts 
or components of the male reproductive system include the penis, scrotum, and testicles. Penis, scrotum, and testicles. Another name for these parts is genitals or genitalia. You know, so male genitals or male genitalia. Note, the epididymis is also considered to be part of the external genitalia or the external part of the male reproductive system. So what constitutes the internal organs in the male reproductive system? The internal uh, organs or if you like the accessory organs in the male reproductive system include vas deferens, ejaculatory darts, urethra, seminal vesicles, prostate glands, and cowper glands or bulburethral glands. Bulburethral glands or simply cowper glands. Uh, the word bulbu rethra is spelled b u l b o u r e t h r e l and kaupa is spelled c o w p e r these are what constitute the internal accessory organ in the male reproductive system of the human being of the human being ladies and gentlemen this is supposed to be an overview of the anatomy and physiology of the human being and it is a vital component of our exploration of the third of human um, biology you know it's a vital component of the human biology uh, why do you need uh, this kind of knowledge you know as an individual you need to know about your uh, body composition uh, your the structures in your body and how they work you know if you can truly become fascinated with uh, uh, how uh, your body organs or systems work and again the constituent of your body and if you are adequately informed you sure will do everything you can to take care of your own body and teach others or tell others to do same it is important that um, uh, we take actions which will help in sustaining the proper functioning of our body systems today uh, you have realized that when it comes to uh, learning about the anatomy and physiology of the living organism there are various uh, subfields or subject areas that we learn for example you've learned about we studying about organization of the body of the human being you have realized that we explore hemostasis and you have realized that uh, we um, can you remind me of the last one that we talked about when we were looking at the uh, the things that constitute the the subject areas okay of the field of anatomy and physiology yes the last one is communication in the body so we explore organization of the body of living organisms homeostasis and communication in the body then you also realize that you have four tissues in your body nervous epithelial muscular and connective tissues you realize that you have so many cells in your body in fact before today you knew about the blood cells the nerve cells the egg cells the sperm cells uh, the hepatocyte or the liver cells and today you also heard about the antigen presenting cells 
contracting cells, endothelial cells, anion transporting cells, killing cells, nervous, uh, nerve cells, phagocytic cells, secretory cells, endocrine, secretory cells, exocrine, secretory cells, matrix, sensory cells, um, stem cells and supporting uh, cells. Yes, you have um, uh, enjoyed uh, today's uh, lesson. Again, you also realize that when it comes to anatomy, we explore what we call gross anatomy, regional anatomy, uh, systemic anatomy, and microscopic anatomy. And then um, you also realize that uh, the body, your body as a human being, consists of 11 uh, organs, 11 organ systems, 11 organ systems. Your body consists of 11 organ systems. And uh, these 11 organ systems carry out key functions to maintain your physiological well being. Your physiological well being. In other words, each of your organ system possess a unique role. And we have actually mentioned all the 11 organ systems in your body and the role they play. We talked about cardiovascular system. We talked about the endocrine system. We talked about the integument, integumentary system. Integumentary system. We talked about the lymphatic system the muscular system, the nervous system, the uh, skeletal system, the digestive system, respiratory system, uh, urinary system, and the reproductive system. I will surely see you again in the next lecture. Do well to remember to come on time. Bye-bye.